This is Ryan Wrench, and you're watching the Big Idea Bible Study video series. I was a youth pastor here in California for almost 10 years and wrote the Big Idea Bible Study as a way to help teenagers get to know the Bible in sort of the same way I wanted to know the Bible when I was a teenager. And when I got on fire for the Lord and God turned my life around in the eighth grade at summer camp, it was through camp sermons that the preachers kept on saying, you need to get into the Word of God. And the way you develop your relationship with God is through a daily time in the Word. And I just kind of bought into that. I just believed what they had to say and I wanted to get into my Bible for myself. And sometimes I didn't exactly know how. I would go into some devotionals and sometimes that was other people's thoughts about the Bible. But the devotionals many times didn't get me into the Bible. And I wanted to spend time with God. And when I really just started to form the habit of sitting down and reading my Bible and praying directly to God and Him speaking directly to me, that was when my relationship with God blossomed. And I finally understood the word relationship then. And now I equate it similar to my relationship with my wife. I spend time with my wife. I talk to her. She talks to me. And it's never like I've doubted my wife's existence. In the same way, I don't doubt God's existence because we spend time together. I talk to him and he talks to me. And it's a sweet relationship that has developed. I figured it up the other day. 15 years of at least weekly, some kind of in-depth study I've been doing. And 20 years now of basically regular Bible reading. And I have my ups and my downs like anybody else, but I can honestly say that it just gets sweeter and fresher. And it's a wonderful book that when I read it, I'm not just reading words on a paper. I'm developing truly a relationship with God. And if this video series can do anything for you, what I really want for you is to be able to open up the scriptures for yourself and to be able to read not just words in a book, not just words on a piece of paper, but understand the scriptures for what they are, God's word to you. To be able to read the word of God and allow that to actually develop a relationship with him through the process. So I pray that the Big Idea Bible Study video series is a blessing to you. We'll see you in the next video.
Okay, welcome to our midweek uh, services on uh, this Wednesday evening. We're glad that you've joined us uh, tonight and we have a couple of changes that uh, you're probably aware of already. We sent out an email and have it on our Facebook uh, post as well due to the governor's uh, panic-driven uh, shutdown of the economy once again. Um, we have... Uh, uh, we are among those that have been told uh, not to meet, but we're going to meet outside. So uh, uh, that still conforms with uh, what they're requesting, requiring. So we'll be meeting outside uh, in the front area. We have a shade cover uh, in place now. And so those services will start earlier due to the uh, to try to avoid the heat. And so at nine o'clock, we want you to gather together. We won't have our uh, Sunday school classes operational for uh, two or three more weeks until we can get back in our building, but uh, we're going to continue to meet. And so nine o'clock for our morning service. And then uh, we're going to go to seven o'clock this Sunday and uh, see how we do with that on our evening service. It's going to be cooler by then and should be quite comfortable outside. So uh, nine o'clock in the morning, seven o'clock in the evening, uh, gathering outside in the front uh, grass area. We do have our junior churches, both operational. They'll be outside as well. But uh, the folks that are overseeing our junior church are excited about uh, that opportunity. We recognize it's going to be numerous distractions probably being outside uh, with the planes flying over and birds flying by and maybe some traffic and such like that. But uh, let's do our best with that. We uh, are looking forward to you being here and uh, you'll be able to uh, adapt to it until we are able to meet back in our uh, in our facilities. Um, we have a um, couple of uh, missionary letters to read here after a little bit, and uh, we'll look at those and also a video from our missionary that was here with us Sunday, the Belasco family to Spain. Uh, we weren't able to show you that uh, video uh, in the fellowship hall, but we'll be able to do that tonight uh, through our uh, media means that we have, and so we're Glad that uh, Christian's back and uh, helping us out with that as well. So we'll get that to that in just a little bit after we do some singing. Here's a scripture song, Psalm 1914. Let the words of my mouth. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord. O Lord, my strength and my Redeemer, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord. Do that one again. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord. O Lord, my strength and my Redeemer, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart Acceptable in thy sight, O Lord. The song Complete in Thee that we're going to sing tonight is based on the verse in Colossians that talks about the sufficiency of Jesus Christ as the only completeness we'll ever need. Our complete sufficiency is in Him. And it was written in the 1850s for a contribution for a hymnal. And then 70 years later, there was kind of a chorus that was added to it. So we're going to sing four verses of that with that chorus as well tonight. Complete in Thee. Complete in Thee, no work of mine Could take, dear Lord, the place of Thine Thy blood hath pardoned, bought for me And I shall stand complete in Thee Complete in thee, each want supplied, and no good thing to me denied. Since thou my portion, Lord, will be, I ask no more. Complete in thee, yea, justified, O blessed thought, and sanctified salvation wrought. 
thy blood hath pardoned bought for me, and glorified I too shall be. Complete in thee, no more shall sin, thy grace has conquered reign within. Thy blood shall bid the tempter flee, and I shall stand complete in thee. Yea, justified, O blessed thought, and sanctified salvation wrought. Thy blood hath pardoned but for me, and glorified I too shall be. Dear Savior, when before thy bar all tongues and tongues assembled are, among the chosen I shall be at thy right hand, complete in thee. Yea, justified, O blessed thought, and sanctified salvation wrought. Thy blood hath pardoned but for me, and glorified I too shall be. Thy blood hath pardoned but for me, and glorified I too shall be. Okay, we have a couple of excerpts I want to read to you also along with the Belasco report. This is uh, a couple of missionaries we'd like you to pray for in uh, your prayer time this week. And we uh, want to, first of all, emphasize the, uh, the Watsons, Dan and Debbie uh, Watson. They're up in Canada, but they're working among the Chinese immigrants there. And so um, they have some good news for us. Debbie said continues to teach a weekly Mandarin ladies Bible study through the media. And they're almost through the book of Luke and remaining faithful in prayer for each other and continue to grow deeper in their uh, Bible study and Christian living as so we thank the Lord for that. We're, we're especially praying for one lady who a week ago realized her sinful condition and understood that the Lord Jesus died for her sin. And so she's very close to salvation. We're asking you to pray that Mrs. C will repent and trust God and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. She's come a long way from communist atheism. And then he, uh, he goes on over the past couple of weeks. Uh, Debbie was able to uh, uh, help a newly saved Chinese lady understand her security and assurance in Christ and to understand uh, who the Bible says she is in Christ and to introduce her to beginning principles of living for Christ. And uh, so as soon as uh, she heard Debbie quoting this Chinese convert, uh, heard De Debbie quoting from uh, her scripture in Mandarin, her eyes of understanding were immediately open and she was overcome with joy and tears as she hung to every word of God. In her words, it was God's divine appointment that he sent you to me. And last week, uh, Dan says he, we had the opportunity to uh, have a barbecue with the Chinese family of, uh, of, um, the, of three that's uh, one of our neighbors in our apartment complex. And they had some very good questions for us um, concerning Christianity and uh, pray that they'll um, respond to the gospel. It was the first time they'd heard it in their language, Mandarin. Uh, he closes with, in this pandemic, God has not put his kingdom on pause with the rest of the world, but he's still making divine appointments and accomplishing his will. Thank you so very much for your faithful prayers and support. And that's Dan and Debbie Watts, uh, Watson, working among Chinese in uh, Canada, British Columbia area. And then we have the Koshichinko family said um, a few excerpts here from the letter. Said, between my son Nikita and I and our church members, we've been giving out uh, several thousand gospel tracts in the streets of our city and striking up conversations with as many people who would listen to us. And many of the tracts have come into Jewish hands and we've had some good conversation with them as well. Uh, the, we haven't ceased our regular uh, Sunday services. We're continuing those with the restrictions that we have uh, in place there during this quarantine. Church is doing fine with a few visitors every other service or so. Two came from our street uh, conversations but haven't been back yet and we plan to visit them at their homes. One of them, Andrew, 46, uh, came back twice already but is not yet saved. Uh, first Sunday in July, we had 19 people in attendance. And that's the highest number that we've had in the quarantine months. Uh, back in June, we had a baptismal service, and I was privileged to baptize my youngest daughter, Sophie, and uh, who got saved this year. So we praise the Lord for that. 
And he says in conclusion, please be assured of our prayers for your families and churches in your country heading into the new presidential elections. Our family is healthy and doing fine, sending our regards and thanking you all for your prayers and support. Uh, let the Lord richly bless you. And that's from Eugene Kozachenko there in Ukraine. And so right this time now, we'll go ahead and see that video uh, from our missionary Belasco. Greetings from Torrente, España. It's an honor to be your missionary here in this uh, region of the world. Torrente has 80,000 people living here. And five minutes down the road in the city of Valencia, there's 800,000 people living. Mi nombre es José Antonio. Eh, Cristo conquistó mi corazón y transformó mi vida. También la de mi familia y aquellos que están junto a mí. A Igreja Batista tem nos ajudado e nos abençoado grandemente, tanto a nós quanto a nossa família que viemos de fora. É nos recebido com muito amor e oração e carinho e tudo o que pode. Na verdade que para mim é uma bendição haver conhecido a esta igreja. Me llamo Daniel, ella es mi madre Asun y somos miembros de la Iglesia Bautista Bíblica de Torrent. Dios nos ha provisto de este lugar y sabemos que Él tiene grandes cosas para este pueblo. Además, Él no hace las cosas a medias, sino que lo que Él comienza lo termina. Hemos estado orando mucho por un sitio y gracias a Dios nos está dando este hermoso lugar. Y yo sé que juntos con su apoyo vamos, podemos hacer una hermosa, establecer una hermosa iglesia más aquí en la ciudad de Torrent. Mi nombre es Rosa, pertenezco a la iglesia de aquí en Torrent y eh, necesitamos un nuevo local y necesitamos vuestra ayuda porque el local en donde estamos ahora se nos ha quedado pequeño porque el Señor está bendiciendo con muchas almas. Queremos que esta obra que el Señor ha abierto aquí en Torrent eh, sea de gran bendición para las nuevas personas que lleguen. Con la ayuda vuestra y la de Dios Todopoderoso y la de nosotros podemos sacar adelante este sitio. Os pido vuestra colaboración para nosotros poder culminar esta obra eh, a través de vosotros. I used to grit here in missionaries in Spain, working alongside the Belascos, who are doing an amazing job here in Spain. And it's been, a, it's been a cool experience to be able to see God move in this church and to see people come into IBBT to, to accept Christ their Savior, to be baptized, and to see the church grow so much that they need a new building. Hi, I'm Leslie Belasco. We are super excited about what God is doing here in Torrent, Spain. Since 2017, the church attendance has tripled, and we have outgrown our building, we've outgrown our auditorium, our one little classroom that we have, and so we are really excited that God has given us this property. We are looking forward to having an auditorium that will hold many people, having two or three classrooms. And we're excited about the future. We purchased this location, and now we're needing to remodel it and move into it so that we can serve at the capacity that, uh, that the demand uh, has for us. Now is the time of the harvest. Leslie and I, we're running just as fast as we can to keep up with what God is wanting to do within our midst. Bible Baptist Church at Torrente is growing uh, each month and we believe that uh, he has provided this place so that we might be able to serve the needs of the people spiritually. God bless you, thank you for all that you're going to do, all that you have done, and uh, it's an honor to continue to serve here and represent you in Torrente, España. Okay, we're continuing our uh, study in the unseen world. The unseen world, we just started this study on angels, and angelic beings, the unseen world is the title of the series. And 
Uh, we're going to be uh, looking into that unseen world some more as we uh, continue today in our, uh, our study. Last week we realized how common the work and ministry of angels is in the Old Testament and in the New. And we uh, mentioned some scriptures um, that uh, refer to the ranks of angels. I had concluded the message last week with a reference to the rank of angels. So we want to look into the ranks of angels a little more detail tonight. And we'll have a number of scriptures to look at, uh, to uh, make reference to. And so we'll be um, doing that. I, uh, will be you, you won't necessarily uh, be able to keep up with all the different references, but Hopefully um, you can uh, look at some of them as we go along here. There's just a, this is more of a, a Bible study than a, than a message that um, is uh, of a sermonic nature because of the nature of the, um, the subject that is before us. There's a good deal of scripture that we want to include. And so uh, follow along as best you can with that. And we'll do as best we can following and keeping you on track uh, with it. We um, have... Uh, Recognized from last week's study that the number of angels is so high that uh, it can't be counted. And so we saw the reference in Hebrews 12, verse 2, to an innumerable company of angels. So the beyond number, too many to count, but they are organized into ranks and orders. And we see that uh, in the Bible as well. Now, originally, it was Lucifer who was the highest ranking angelic being. He is uh, referred to as uh, the covering cherub. And so um, the covering cherub would imply that he uh, was the archangel or the highest angel over all the other angels covering all the other angelic beings. And so uh, that was originally the state of uh, the order and ranking. But uh, when he... Uh, rebelled against God and was cast out of heaven, uh, then he, of course, is no longer holding that coveted position of the covering cherub. He is a, an angelic being, but he is a fallen angel. He is a, a fallen being and now the head of the uh, powers of darkness. So as we proceed through this study, we're going to be looking at uh, not only the heavenly angels, but also the role of the fallen angels and what their what their ranks and purposes are as well. And the Bible does uh, give us warning and uh, counsel concerning uh, our uh, dealings on earth with uh, those uh, beings who are the emissaries of evil. But that won't be today's study. Primarily we'll be looking at the angelic beings order of ranking and uh, talking a little bit about that. So after the fall of Lucifer, the covering cherub, the, uh, the highest ranking angel at the time, now we have references in the Bible to uh, an archangel, the, the, the uh, position, the rank of archangel. And we see that, De that uh, Michael is the only angel that is given this title, archangel. So it's likely, it's uh, possible that he is the only archangel. There has been speculation that the other one mentioned, the, the angel Gabriel is also an archangel, but uh, there's no specific uh, passage of scripture that identifies Gabriel in that capacity, although it is so with Michael. So uh, Michael the archangel, as he's called, uh, the Hebrew word that is the, his name Michael means who is like God, who is like God. And we see Michael mentioned several times in the Bible. If you've got your Bible over to the book of Jude, you can look at Jude uh, 9, Jude verse 9. And, uh, and then uh, follow along as I read. It says, Yet Michael the archangel, when contending with the devil, uh, he disputed about the body of Moses, durst not bring against him any railing accusation, but said, The Lord rebuke thee. So the archangel Michael is contending there with the devil himself and the contention deals with the body of Moses and the implications are many in this passage of scripture and among them is the fact that there is a warfare, uh, a, a, um, a conflict between the heavenly angels and the angels of darkness, that there is an ongoing conflict there in those two 
kingdoms, the kingdom of light and the kingdom of darkness. And the um, uh, angel uh, Michael, the archangel Michael, as he's referred to in that passage, is, is uh, pl uh, placed up against the devil. And even in that case, he said, the Lord rebuke thee and didn't try to take him on by himself. This is good counsel for us to not ever think that we in ourselves and our, of our own strength are able to overcome the powers of darkness, but that we must rely upon the strength and the power of the Lord. We must join Michael the archangel in saying, the Lord be the one to re rebuke thee. So uh, Revelation chapter 12 and verse uh, 7 is another passage uh, which refers to Michael in his position as archangel. In Revelation 12, 7, and there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels. So again, the uh, conflict, the warfare that uh, is mentioned there, specifically the war in heaven, the uh, conflict there uh, suggests to us the realm of uh, angels, the realm of these unseen beings that it is in the heavens and the heaven of heavens and that uh, it is in our atmosphere and the Bible calls Satan the prince of the powers of the air, the power of the air. And so um, you have Michael in that capacity as archangel. Now go to Daniel chapter 10, Daniel chapter 10 and verse uh, 10 through 14. Daniel chapter 10 verse 10 through 14. This refers to Michael also in an interesting passage. Daniel chapter 10, verse 10. And behold, a hand touched me, which set me upon my knees and upon the palms of my hands. And he said unto me, O Daniel, a man greatly beloved, understand the words that I speak unto thee and stand upright, for unto thee am I now sent. And when he had spoken this word unto me, I stood trembling. Then said he unto me, Fear not, Daniel, for from the first day that thou didst set thy heart to understand and to chasten thyself before thy God, thy words were heard, and I am come for thy words. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me one and twenty days. So there's a, uh, there's a conflict there in the unseen world. This being, this fallen angelic being that is referred to here as the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me one in 20 days, but lo, Michael, one of the chief princes came to help me. So there's a, there's an angel that is speaking to, uh, to Daniel here and saying that I would have been here sooner, but there was a interference from the one that was the prince of the powers of uh, Persia, the unseen angel of darkness that uh, has a connection with Persia there and he interfered with the angel's uh, attempt to bring the message to Daniel for three weeks, for 21 days. And so he's re referring to that event and he says, but the archangel Michael, but lo Michael, one of the chief princes came to help me and I remained there with the kings of Persia. Now I am come to make thee understand what shall befall thy people in the latter days, for yet the vision is for many days." So the messenger of, uh, of God to Daniel was interfered with and uh, called Michael, the archangel. And the, the, uh, between uh, Michael and uh, that angel, the message did get through uh, here. But the, uh, the point of interest I wanted to uh, point out in relationship to our study tonight refers to the fact that Michael is called one of the chief princes so as far as rank is concerned, there are other chief princes in the rankings of angels, obviously. He's one of the chief princes. There, there would be other categories of chief princes uh, who have rank and status in the angelic um, order of things. Uh, so uh, chief princes, they, there's been uh, um, uh, from the liberal um, loony left, there have been calls to eliminate the word chief from all uh, of our rankings in various forms of business, the, the uh, various chiefs in uh, military and the chief petty officer and the uh, chief of operations and so forth like that. There's those that uh, 
uh, are of the hypersensitive nature that believe that that somehow is an attack upon our Native American culture. And of course, the word chief was around a long time before we referred to uh, the chief of tribes as a chief. The word chief has been around a long time. And here is a reference to that, that one of the chief uh, princes in the heavenly order of things, the chief princes in the, in the angelic kingdom. Uh, but um, Michael is referred to as among those, though he is called an archangel. Um, Michael has the responsibility of acting in the interest of Israel. When we see him, that is the connection that is always made with Michael. There's some connection with Israel. You're in Daniel. Look at chapter 12 and verse 1. Chapter 12 and uh, verse number 1. At that time, Michael, uh, at, uh, and at that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince which standeth for the children of thy people, and, uh, and there shall be a time of trouble such as, never, uh, such, as, uh, such as never was since there was a nation even to that same time. And so we have... Uh, Michael referred to there in connection with the, um, the, the nation of Israel. And, every, and in every case, you, you'll see that. Um, and so he goes on and, and says that, um, and that at that time, thy people shall be delivered. Everyone shall be found in the book. So um, the people of Israel and the connection with Michael, the one who is the archangel of God, is uh, obvious and evident in the scripture. In connection with that, in the New Testament, we find him being the one that will announce the rapture of the saints. Of, of the saints. Go to uh, uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse uh, 16. 1 Thessalonians 4, verse uh, number 16. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout and with the voice of the archangel and the trump of God and the dead in Christ shall rise first. So the voice of the archangel, the archangel, obviously referring to the, uh, the um, uh, angel Michael, it will be the uh, one that announces the uh, rapture. Now, you may wonder the connection with Israel there, but you realize that as the rapture occurs at that point in time, now the heavenly father begins uh, to take up again and recommence his work with the nation of Israel through the tribulation period and then on out the other side of the tribulation, we have Israel being taken up again by God at that point of the, uh, of the announcement of the archangel Michael that the rapture of the saints will occur and the trump of God will sound and we'll be caught out of here. From the, the indications that going on in the world of late, a lot more of us are uh, thinking about when that time might be that uh, the Lord would uh, would be calling us home. If it be now or a hundred years from now, we are wanting to be ready and wanting to be prepared. So uh, as we look at that angel and that reminder of one of his purposes being an announcer, the announcer of the rapture that is to uh, come in the future. So uh, now the, uh, the only other angel that is given by name in the Bible, as I mentioned already, is the angel Gabriel. And it seems his primary function in relationship to man is uh, dealing with announcements. We can safely assume that he is one of the chief princes that we saw referred to in the book of Daniel, but uh, his work is always something to do with announcements. He announced Daniel's prophecy of the 70 weeks of years. He was the one that was uh, sent to announce that prophecy of that uh, period of time where God would uh, uh, deal with Israel that 483 years until Messiah is cut off from the announcement of Cyrus till the t time of Messiah was crucified on the, on the cross. That period of time was the 69 of the 70 weeks of years. And then there's one more set of seven years to be dealt with and one more week of years to be dealt with. And that's the tribulation week of years, if you will, a seven year period of time where God is after the rapture dealing with the nation of Israel and gathering them back together has already begun to occur, but they're gathered back together in Israel now, currently in unbelief and in the secular state. But that time will come when uh, the uh, tribulation time uh, occurs that Israel will be dealt with through that whole time. 
And so we're we're uh, looking at that on our prophetic calendar coming up. And that was announced, first of all, by Gabriel. He also announced the birth of John the Baptist, actually the conception and birth of John the Baptist in Luke chapter 1. Uh, verse 11 and verse 19, he appears to Zechariah. When Zechariah is doing his ministrations in the uh, holy place. He's the, his uh, order of things is to burn the incense at the altar of incense. And he is there doing his uh, priestly duty, Zechariah, at that time. Uh, and um, we see the angel and angel appears to him. We find that that angel later is identified in verse 19 uh, of Luke 1 as Gabriel, the one that appeared to him. And he says to Zechariah and his unbelief, he says, how can this thing be when the announcement is made that John the Baptist will uh, uh, be born to he and Elizabeth in their old age? He uh, he balks at that and can't believe that is a possibility. And of course, it is an impossibility, but he doesn't believe the message of the angel initially. And so he is struck dumb for that and the, the, uh, because the reason is given that the angel says, Gabriel says, I am Gabriel. And because you didn't believe what I just told you, uh, you're going to be dumb. The sign you asked for is that you're going to be dumb until the time of the birth of your son, John. And you're going to call him John. And so uh, that was the case with Zechariah as he questioned the, uh, the ministry of uh, the announcing angel Gabriel there. He also announced Jesus' birth as, or his conception as well in uh, Luke chapter 1 and verse 26, just a little further uh, down, the, uh, down the page there, Luke chapter 1, verse 26, we see the announcement that comes to uh, Joseph and Mary regarding the birth of Jesus. And so uh, Mary has a different take on it. She asked the question, but it's not a question to ask in unbelief, uh, but um, she wants an explanation, a clarification uh, there. And so um, she doesn't face the same uh, result as Zacharias did in his uh, in his nature, in his uh, spirit of unbelief, in his question. So we have the work of Gabriel being that of uh, an, an announcer to mankind. You have then in the rankings, in the order of things, the term cherubim used. Cherubim, it's a plural of cherubs. Uh, we'd say, we would say in English cherubs, but cherubim, I am, is the plural of that. And they are seen in Scripture, and when we find them, they're seen in Scripture as guardians, as guardians. They are the ones that are put as sentinels at Eden's gate. Look back at uh, uh, chapter 3 of the book of uh, Genesis. Chapter 3, the book of Genesis, and uh, you can see them there in chapter 3, Genesis uh, verse uh, 24, chapter 3, verse 24. So he drove out the man and he placed at the east of the Garden of Eden cherubims. And I'm uh, not able to tell you why the S is on the end of cherubims there. Uh, that's for you to find out. And a flaming sword which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. So there's place of sentinels there at the gates of Eden to keep people from, to keep Adam and Eve uh, after the curse and cast out of the garden, to keep them from coming back into the garden and partaking of the tree of life. And the uh, idea there, the principle there is that they're, uh, they have taken the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. They have fallen. They're in a sinful state to then partake of the tree of life would be to live forever in their sinful state. And so they're guarded from that by the grace of God and by the mercy of God until they uh, are able to um, recognize the, uh, the salvation in Christ that is represented in the blood of the sacrificial lamb. So the cherubim, there are guardians there in that passage. And, and then we see them surrounding the throne of heaven and it's in a uh, capacity like you would find a, uh, a gr group of guards you find in thrones and in places where there are people in power and authority. They're always surrounding them, these sentinels, these guards, these guardians uh, for their safety. Of course, God does not need guardians for his safety. He's the all-powerful, almighty God. But they represent, in this case, guardians in, in the sense of pr providing an image of, uh, for man of the holy and uh, the holiness, the honor, the power of almighty God. And we see them surrounding the throne of God in the scriptures. In Psalm 80 and verse 1, it, uh, it speaks of God as thou that dwellest between the cherubim 
And it says, shine forth. In Psalm 90 and verse 1, he that sitteth between the cherubim. Uh, these would appear to be the same as the living creatures that we looked at last time in Ezekiel chapter 1. They would be the, appear also to be the same as those that are referred to as the beasts of, uh, of Revelation chapter 6, and uh, J Revelation chapter 4, verse 6 through verse 9. So let's take a, a look at Revelation chapter 4, verse 6 through verse 9 and read that. And uh, see these beasts. When we use the term beast in our modern vernacular, we tend to think of it as, um, as a negative in the sense of, a, of a, an animal that's uh, wild and, and a, or a person that's uh, wild. We would think of them in the term beast. But uh, the scripture uses this word as a being that is, uh, uh, that is awe-inspiring and fearful and um, is one that uh, is not to be contended with. And so Revelation chapter 4, verse 6, let's look at this odd, strange, and uh, unusual description here. Revelation 4, and verse 6 through verse 9. And before the throne, there was a sea of glass like unto crystal. And in the midst of the throne, and round about the throne, were four beasts full of eyes before and behind. The first beast was like a lion, and the second beast like a calf, and the third beast had the face of a man, and the fourth beast was like a flying eagle. And the four beasts had each of them six wings about him. They were full of eyes within, and they rest not day or night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which, is, which was and is and is to come. And uh, when those beasts uh, give glory and honor and thanks unto him that sat on the throne... Who's, who liveth forever and ever. So we have these beings surrounding the throne in the sense that you would think of a sentinel or a guard or guardian uh, there around the throne. Now look again at a longer passage of scripture that deals with these uh, living creatures, these beings, these ones uh, called beasts. They're referred to as uh, in the capacity of cherubim in Ezekiel chapter 10. So let's look there, uh, Ezekiel chapter 10 and uh, verse 8 through verse 22. Ezekiel chapter 10, verse 8 through verse uh, 22. And there appeared in the cherubims the form of a man's hand under their wings. And when I looked, behold, the four wheels by the cherubims, one wheel by one cherub, another wheel by another cherub, and the appearance of the wheels was as the color of barrel stone. And as for their appearance, they four had one likeness, as of a wheel that had been in the midst of a wheel. When they went, they went upon their four sides. They turned not as they went, but to the place whither the head looked, they followed it. They turned not as they went. Their body and their backs and their hands and their wings and the wheels were full of eyes round about, even the wheels that they four had. As for the wheels, it was cried unto them in my hearing, O wheel! And every one had four faces. The first face was the face of a cherub, the second face, the face of a man, the third face, the face of a lion, the fourth face, the face of an eagle. The cherubims were lifted up. This is a living creature that I saw by the river Kabar. And, then, and when the cherubims went, the wheels went by them. And when the cherubims lifted up their wings to mount up from the earth, the same wheels also turned not from beside them. And when they stood, these stood. And when they were lifted up, these lifted up themselves also. For the spirit of the living creature was in them. Then the glory of the Lord departed from off the threshold of the house and stood before the cherubims. And the cherubims lifted up their eyes, uh, lifted up their wings, and mounted up from the earth in my sight. And when they went out, the uh, when they went out, uh, the wheels uh, also were beside them. Every one stood at the door of the east gate in the Lord's house, and the glory of God, the God of Israel, was over them above. This is the living creature that I saw under the God of Israel by the river Kabar, that and I knew that they were cherubims. Everyone had four faces apiece, everyone had four wings, and the likeness of the hands of a man was under their wings. And uh, the 
likeness of their faces was the same faces which I saw by the river Kabar and their appearance and themselves. And they went every one straight forward. That is a hard to wrap your mind around a conception of what these uh, uh, cherubims were. And the, uh, the S added on the end there would suggest to us that these uh, cherubim were of several classes. Uh, like we use the word people. When we use the term people, we're talking about more than one person. We're talking about multiples of people. But when we use the word peoples, we're talking about different classes, different groups, different nations of people. And so that's the idea here with these cherubim, that there weren't just one classification of them, but uh, several classifications of them, uh, sometimes referred to here as living creatures, beasts, uh, cherubim, and uh, the various descriptions of them there. It's beyond really anything that we can really fully conceive of, but we know that um, they are described in the Bible as beings that reflect the glory, the beauty, the holiness of God. And so we can only, we can only imagine what they might look like until the day comes when we shall be able to see them. And that will be quite uh, a day. Uh, what a fascination there is with the prospects and possibilities. And you may have seen those who have attempted by the works of art that they have done to represent these uh, beings in some fashion or another. But none would come even close, I'm certain, to what they actually would be like. So another rank of these angelic beings in the Bible is called seraphim. Seraphim. They're only mentioned once in the scriptures. In Isaiah chapter 6 and verse 1 through 3, we see the mention of the seraphim. And they are said to be in a different position than the cherubs were who surround the throne of God and are seen as uh, guardians of the throne of God. They're seen in that sense as sentinels there, uh, protecting the honor and holiness of God. But there are another group called seraphim and their position is a little bit different. They're described as being above the throne of God. Of course, not in the sense of above in power and majesty and glory, but above the throne of God, magnifying the holiness of God. And that seems to be their, their purpose, their function is to simply magnify the holiness of God. They're the ones that Isaiah refers to as crying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. And so their work is to magnify God's holiness. They are similar to the cherubim. They have uh, six wings and uh, they're described in their position there. The cherubim, we saw one reference to cherubim having the six wings there. And by the way, in the Bible, the uh, the only ones that are that we're told have six wings are those that are called cherubs and those that are called seraphs. They are described as having wings, but the angelic beings that we see in Scripture visiting man are not, uh, they don't have wings. They are coming in the appearance of a man. The wings belong to the cherub and the seraph. Uh, so uh, as far as the Scripture reveals to us anyway, that's the way it is. So the concept of ranking in celestial kingdom is both in the kingdom of light and in the kingdom of darkness. There are rankings there that are uh, referred to in the Bible in Colossians chapter 1 and verse 16 and Ephesians 1 and chapter 1 and chapter 6. We have references to the order, these rankings of power that are in both the kingdom of darkness and the kingdom of light. We have uh, the, uh, the references being to thrones and then dominions and then principalities and powers. Uh, these various uh, rankings are, are um, suggested as uh, we study these out and they have relationship both positively and negatively in the uh, kingdoms of this world that there are corresponding powers that be in the kingdom of light, the kingdom of darkness, that have influence and effect in the kingdoms of this world. So from Daniel chapter 10, verse 12 and 13, we can see that behind the earthly thrones and the earthly dominions and principalities and powers, there are these celestial powers at work, both good and evil. It's uh, given to us there in the, in the book of Daniel. If you want to take a look there as we uh, get ready to wrap things up, Tonight in the Daniel chapter 10, verse 12 and 13, uh, you have these, these words. Then said he unto me, Fear not, Daniel, 
For from the first day that thou didst set thy heart to understand and to chasten thyself before God, thy words were heard. And I am come for thy words. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me one and twenty days. But lo, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, and I remained there with the kings of Persia. So that passage that we read earlier in reference to uh, the, the chief of the princes being one of Michael's, um, Michael being one of them, the chief of the princes. Uh, here we see the conflict that is referred to between, and on verse 20 you see this, more of the same, in the conflict that is going on between the powers of darkness and the powers of light. And so the implications there with, um, with Colossians chapter 1 and verse 16, Ephesians chapter 1, Chapter 6 is the spiritual warfare that is taking place, the, uh, the work of uh, devils and, and angels, uh, the, the work of darkness, the work of light that is uh, constantly ongoing behind the scenes, that unseen world that, uh, where, the, where the battle is taking place. And so uh, we need to be aware of that. And as we'll learn in more detail as we get it into the study a little further, we'll recognize the place of angels and the place uh, that uh, the powers of darkness have in principalities and in powers and in the um, battle for man's soul. So all these things become very, very important for us to understand as we proceed with this, with our understanding of the work and the ministry of angels, which we'll look into next week in more detail, the ministry of angels to man. Father, we ask you to add your blessing to the study tonight. We pray that as we think about the unseen world, we are given a glimpse into that unseen world through the scriptures. And Father, as we are given these uh, insights, we know that there uh, is a purpose in our learning these things and knowing about them. And so, Father, I pray that you'd help us to understand that purpose and then to uh, be prepared for the spiritual war uh, warfare, which is um, always going on. And we ask, Father, that you would uh, help us to apply the scriptures and, and not to lean on to our own wisdom and our own strength, but to uh, take the example of Michael and recognize that only the power of the Lord can uh, be greater than the power of darkness and the power of evil. So we pray, Father, that You'd help us to bear that in mind as we move uh, on through our uh, walk and our lives with Thee. We ask Your blessing on the rest of the week and our services on Sunday. We pray that You'd intervene on our behalf and help us to honor You with our, with our presence as a people congregating together to worship and honor Thee on this uh, Sunday services. We pray Your blessing now on these things in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Amen. Well, that concludes this evening's service. Tune in for our next service. Only our evening services are going to be streamed in this way. You have to check our Facebook feed or our church website for the most up-to-date information. Go to cbctemecula.com. Our morning services are in person, but if you're unable to make it to the morning service, then join us online for our live stream of those services. And then the evening services will still just be video only. So Sunday nights, at 6 o'clock, Wednesday nights at 7 o'clock. We'll just see you for the next service.